afternoon. Welcome to the presentation on system state clustering using eBBF data. My name is Sujit Samuel. I am a principal software engineer at Ericsson in the global AI accelerator unit. One of the responsibilities that I handle is the system state observability. We monitor the behavior of the systems to ensure consistency and security. What are we going to cover today? We are going to see what is eBPF, what is clustering, what is eBPF and clustering together, what are some of the potential use cases of this, and finally, we can go through some questions if you have any. What is eBPF? eBPF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. Prior to this, there was BPF, which is the Berkeley Packet Filter, primarily used for analyzing network traffic in operating systems like Unix. EBPF programs are event driven and are run when the kernel or an application passes a certain hook point. What this allows us to do is to extend the behavior of the Linux kernel. Traditionally, if you have to extend or if you have to contribute in some way to the kernel so as to modify its behavior, you have to do a lot of testing. You have to ensure a lot of consistencies in the code. What eBPF allows you to do is write your own custom programs which are executed at certain points in the execution of the kernel and those programs which you have written will be isolated and will be tested by something called an eBPF verifier which ensures that your user space program or the eBPF program does not access anything more or violate the memory constraints that it is supposed to respect. When all can you execute eBPF programs? Predefined hooks include system calls, function entry exits, kernel trace points, user trace points, network events, and several others. Once you hit that en entry point or the wherever the EBPF program is attached, you can run that program and pass the data back to the user space via something called an EBPF or BPF map. What are these maps? These maps are, you can consider them as a cache, cache which stands between Linux space and the user space. So the eBPF program will populate the BPF map and your user space program can actually access that BPF map and do its own processing. So here we see the pictorial representation of whatever I was talking in the previous slide. So you can see eBPF can attach itself to some execution points in the kernel which are called whenever, let us say on the left hand side we see a storage driven eBPF call, any process that reads or writes calls the eBPF program just by the virtue of the eBPF program being attached to a storage syscall. On the right hand side we can see the same thing but on a network event. So a traffic comes in or a request comes in we have our xdp or the ebpf program ebpf xdp program that is attached on that particular network request and it triggers itself so that program can actually pass in again the data back so you can see it is attached to sockets it is attached to all these tcp ip interfaces so this is how ebpf allows us to customize the behavior so you can at any point, at any place in the Linux kernel where you can insert something or you want to monitor it, it is possible by the virtue of eBPF. This here is an example of an eBPF program. Now, as I said, there are, there are on the top we see a struct called a map, and down we see a section which is actually going to be triggered on a K probe. K probe is a kernel probe, right? You can attach this particular eBPF program on the function axis exec v. And this will tell you how many times that particular function has been invoked by the virtue of this particular eBPF program which executed in the kernel space passing the value into a map that is being read in the user space. So here you see in the section, in the actual program section, it actually looks up the map and sees whether the element already exists. If it exists, then it increments the value. If it doesn't exist, then it will create the value and update it. Right? So this will actually increment each time that particular function is called and that incremented value sits in the map and the map can be read in the user program and that's how it works now you're going to see what is clustering clustering is a machine learning algorithm which can help us cluster different data points into multiple classes this basically 
lands upon the premise that things which are similar tend to be closer to each other than dissimilar things on the right hand side itself you can see that this particular graph right we see that there are some black points there are some red points and there are some green points and there is a very fine there is a very well defined line or a or a demarcation between each of the three different points now this has been achieved by an algorithm called k means right k means and if you say three clusters right so k means is a machine learning algorithm which says that okay i will help you cluster your data points into whatever clusters that you decide and based on that this k means will actually run some sort of algorithm behind and say that okay this cluster belongs to this this point belongs to this cluster and this cluster has the centroid of the cluster is this and each cluster will have a centroid and the distance from the centroid will actually be uh, determining the class of that particular point right so clustering is essentially a machine learning algorithm that helps us to group similar behaving data points or similar data points together so here just to cover a clustering example we we know about the data set the iris data set the iris data set is a very famous data set in machine learning and almost all the people who start machine learning actually definitely encounter this data set in their in their in their starting time right when we we, we use a data set to do a lot of machine learning trials ourselves so what is data set contains is a, a list of a number of records with different details about a flower the iris flower right there are there are the details are given like petal width sepal length petal length all these details are given and there are a lot of records which actually need to be segregated and clustered together to understand the closeness of the data points right now if you see this graph that has been projected we clearly see that there are there are three different data points right so there is a green one there is a yellow one and there is a kind of a violet one that towards the end towards this towards the end side right so this is actually a very good example of a machine learning algorithm called clustering running on that particular data set and helping us to identify these three different clusters that you can see right i, I picked up this example from scikit-learn a, a really great clustering algorithm called k-means now how do these how do these two terminologies that we discussed these technologies that we discussed right ebpf and clustering they can come together right uh, ebpf can help us to generate data points right so what all data points do you want to generate you can generate data point about access of a particular file you can generate a data point about network requests that come in you can generate data points about behavior of that particular system as in the cpu load or is how many how many read failures or these are the kind of these are the kind of things that ebf can help us generate and once that data is generated clustering can help us cluster the data points right how will clustering help us to actually segregate the data points there could be an innate sense of algorithmic understanding which says that which which the clustering can provide us saying that okay this particular data point that has been generated might not be a good network access right you could actually you could actually help by doing some sort of data labeling yeah you know create some sort of test scenarios in which you have negative classes and positive classes and then data labeling can actually aid this particular machine learning process so not essentially clustering but some sort of labeling that can be used to provide some sort of input to supervised algorithms now clustering is an unsupervised algorithm but you can use this data that is generated in ebpf to run some supervised algorithmic supervised machine learning scenarios production scenario in production scenario you can use the model what all you have generated to actually predict in real time whether the data point actually belongs to a right behavior of the system or wrong behavior of the system so our our aim here is basically to understand whether the system behavior right now is actually correct or it's not correct right and the idea that we are discussing here is whether ebpf can help us so clustering can help us to understand or segregate the data whether ebp and ebpf can help us to generate the data whether the combination of this can help us understand whether the system is behaving in a proper way that's what we are discussing so i believe ebpf can generate the data clustering can help us cluster the data so just to elaborate on the scenario that we discussed in the previous slide right so 
there are there are some classes of ebf programs right which are going to detect network uh, which are going to be attached to network uh, interfaces so this is an xdp program there is an ebpf socket filter program so xdp basically stands for express data path so express data path basically means that uh, this is an interface that is going to be hit the first whenever a network packet is received right so by that what i mean is at this point in time even a struct socket buffer has not been allocated the skb st uh, struct has not been allocated and it has not been passed through the network stack so it has first, first hit the xdp xdp buffer is allocated what all you can do at this particular point of time is you can actually analyze and you can reject this that particular packet at a very early point in time of the network request so that there is not enough load on the system to actually allocate all these buffers right and that will help us alleviate some of the system load in case we we understand that this is from a wrong ip or this is this is this is a network attack right so what happens is whenever a network packet is received and you have an ebpf program attached to an express data path right this particular program will actually read that particular packet and will actually extract some details from there right like input what is the ip address that it is coming from what are this what, what are the headers what, what are the header information what number of bytes whatever it is you can take any details from it and then you can put into this particular thing called a map that we already discussed now this map sits in between of the kernel space execution as well as the user space right so all the details that you have put into the map are actually accessible on the user space now so once once it once the kernel or the upf program has actually put into a map you have a user space program that actually reads the map and let's say pushes this data to a to a really fast cache store like let's say, to a really fast store like redis let's say right what happens once so this data is continuously going to redis right and then your machine learning platform actually could actually read this particular data and run clustering on it right run clustering on it to understand whether this particular network request that is received is actually good or is it a valid network request or is it really uh, because we all have some predicted or predictable behaviors right any time we we any time any behavior mostly is predictable right so there are time series algorithms which could run on this particular data to understand whether this particular behavior of network uh, or network packet request is really uh, something that we expect if not then yes we have we have aided the system observability by actually classifying a particular uh, network behavior as invalid and that is possible because we have used this ebpf and clustering together so ebpf can help us to understand the 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 real system behavior clustering will run on the data that is being generated by the ebpf to actually help us to understand whether this is this behavior is expected or not so here we see uh, the network traffic use case in a little bit more detail right so on the left hand side you can see so there are there are there is a receive queue and there is a transmission queue and right and then there is this bpf, BPF program that is actually sitting on the driver uh, on the interface right and this program can actually do three things you know it can pass the traffic up the network stack it can actually redirect it or it can just simply drop it drop basically means that that packet will never travels up the stack never loads your system and that's the best place to actually reject the incoming network traffic now a lot of ddo distributed denial of service attacks actually can be uh, dropped if if the xdp program is really uh, you know good enough right so what happens on the left hand side you see an incoming request right the incoming request uh, reaches the receive queue and th at that particular point of time it is actually intercepted by the xdp bpf program right xdp bpf program actually intercepts the request and then this particular bpf program actually can write this data whatever data you want along with the time time of the request and everything into a map and then the user space actually program actually reads the map and sends the data to a clustering system to ascertain whether it belongs to a valid cluster the valid cluster uh, we saw what is a valid cluster right we saw in the iris example right uh, there are clusters of let us say there are clusters of data points which appear valid there are clusters of data points which appear uh, not valid and there are clusters of data which can downrightly be rejected so if we find out that the data that is coming which is being populated in the map actually belongs to a downright uh, you know rejected traffic then yes uh, this methodology can actually help us to reject the traffic right away and help us you know uh, improve the performance of the system in case of 
it's things like attacks like DDoS attacks or any other attacks that we see. So here we see it's a it's a really good combination of uh, a, a functionality that is being used to extend the Linux kernel and machine learning. Both these things can work together to actually aid in better performance of the system. Uh, this is one more use case uh, which is tied to the observability of the system whether you want to see whether the system uh, is behaving properly or not basically means that uh, when you are when your system is executing should a particular program be triggered or should a particular file be accessed or not or whether if it's getting accessed is it access getting accessed correctly or not so for those kind of things we can actually attach uh, ebpf programs to events right perf events right you can create perf events those particular uh, events are attached to kernel functions so you have a kernel function that is triggered uh, the kernel function which is triggered actually has the ebpf program attached to it once the ebpf program gets triggered again it populates a map uh, we know the map uh, that map is being accessed from user space program uh, the user space program actually uh, takes the details from the map and sends it over to the clustering algorithm the clustering algorithm then determines whether that particular file or the ex executable that is accessed is uh, supposed to be accessed in that way or not, or supposed to be accessed that particular time or not. And then it says, uh, yeah, it's a valid access, it's a non-valid access. So again, this uh, will, this is one of the use cases in which you again use machine learning to actually understand whether the system that is being observed has uh, has correct behavior or not. So we saw in the previous slide the network traffic check, right? So uh, an example in this along the similar lines could be a system performance degradation check. So what is a system performance? System performance is nothing but a but, but how you expect your system to actually perform during a during any point of time, right? When it is getting degraded, when you have a lot of read failures, let's say you have a lot of read failures, or you have a lot of packet drops, or you get, you have a lot of uh, uh, you have a lot of indicators that are being generated to say that okay, um, my system is not behaving properly. Those kind of things ca are definitely uh, uh, can be found out in the kernel itself. So kernel, when it is trying to give out some indicators like system problem is getting degraded, at those points of time, EBF program can help us to actually take that data, <clears throat> move it into a central uh, map, and then user space program is like to read those maps and say okay, yeah, system performance might get degraded at some point of time in the future so that's a time series analysis that we can do you can actually help have machine learning algorithm which can actually uh, read the data of the system performance degradation data that is being generated by the kernel and actually help us to predict okay you know what i have seen this trend earlier and this basically means that in another 10 or 15 minutes you are going to have a systems down uh, notification coming up so please take care of that that again leads to a use case like preventive maintenance right what is why do you need to maintain uh, you know things like uh, uh, hard disk racks or uh, storage racks so you have disk failures that are starting so disk failures uh, when they st st uh, begin to happen you have you have many other ways to check whether disk failures happen but this is again some of the some of the some of the uh, use cases that potential use cases that we see if we are uh, if 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 the internal pmu counters or pro management unit counters actually help us to understand uh, some sort of system load then that again can be fed into an EBPF map, and EBPF uh, and the and the and the and the algorithm on the other side can help us to understand whether this particular data point that has come in is actually a positive data point or a negative data point. So yeah, that's that's a good thing. So that, that's a good thing that can help us to uh, really make use of this these two technologies together. So yeah, so these are the these are some of the use cases that we see, and actually we are trying to explore all these use cases right now uh, and uh, try to see how EBPF and clustering can come together. And with that, we come to the end of the presentation, right? And so we have seen how uh, eBPF and clustering can help us uh, in actually uh, predicting some sort of system behavior in the future. It could actually help us to uh, do much better with the system observability use cases that we are currently pursuing. And we are actually currently working on um, a lot of such use cases, yeah, right? And the implementation is right now in progress, wherein uh, some sort of machine learning and eBPF can come together and uh, uh, and whether it can really help us to predict a system down much much in advance as compared to the existing methodologies or as compared to the existing technologies that we have right now so uh, with this we come to the end of the presentation i am i would be more than happy to take any questions if you have so yeah thank you